How we frame a story creates the kinds of endings that can be imagined. The ending, the future calling the present to take a definitive shape, causes us to experience the present in a particular way. This is why it's so important to decenter things, to frame stories from the margins. If we always ask questions from the center, from the expected power structure, we will always get the same kind of answers. Why? Because over time, power becomes obvious and expected, and then power becomes self-justifying. So as we enter into Matthew 18, 10 to 14, listening for critiques of settler Christianity, the Christianity says that we come in, we colonize, and we try to conform things to the expected. We want to keep 18.1 in the back of our minds. Otherwise, child can take on any shape we think of, and it becomes an empty vessel for us to fill with meanings of whether it's innocence or naivete or purity when it was an answer to a question where it says in 18.1 that at that moment the disciples came to Jesus saying who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven so Jesus use of child from 2 to 14 is a response to their question the disciples question is driven by how they see the story ending a story of conquest which ends with them holding power over others so when a child is placed in the midst of them as an example, it is done as a critique of settler Christianity, of a faith which desires power over to coercively conform, legislate, and bind the world around them. The assumed ending affecting how they entered into Jesus' story is not a then and there problem. This isn't just the disciples being dense, although it can feel that way when we read. It is how all of humanity works because we bring stories in with us. And it's how all of us enter into the story of Jesus. It's like a famous sermon that we've heard in America, sinners in the hands of an angry God, moved people to tears and repentance. It is said that they could feel the fires of hell warming the feet in the, in the floor. They were so convinced of hell that their body experienced it as heat in a lived reality. The assumed ending of the story we tell will create the reality we live into, just like the assumed ending of hell, fire, and brimstone for the people sitting in the sermon of sinners in the hands of an angry God, felt the floor of the building starting to burn. A lot of us within the Christian tradition have been warned by the fires of hell as we tell a story of our sacred redemption and everyone else's destruction. In this narrative, the sinner's body is just the necessary fuel to keep the unholy fires burning. After warming ourselves by its glow, we perform mental gymnastics at the level of Simone Biles to keep God loving and the fires burning. Yet it becomes difficult to tell this story. It becomes difficult to stoke the flames of hell and connect it to Jesus when we sit within his storytelling. <clears throat> As Jesus responded to the questions of the disciples who wanted power over, as he responded to the settler questions who seek to colonize and control, in 10 he says, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, the marginalized, the powerless, those who get settled rather than build empires. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go search for the one that is lost? And if he turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the ninety-nine that have not gone astray. It is not the will of your Father who is in heaven for one of these ones to perish. Not even one of the little, powerless, marginalized to perish. So whenever they find the lost one, they rejoice over them more than the rest. So the logic of Jesus' story reverses the expected, the common understanding. Because in the common understanding, it is the sanctity, the holiness, the, the isolatedness of the 99 that would give them the right to power, would bring the promise and the celebration. Yet as he reverses the common understanding where the assumed ending placed the present as a holy punishment made tangible by the explicit power of Rome in their area, and then the reward would have to be 
when the disciples would be able to have a right to grasp that same form of power, a Roman sword. For Jesus, following other Jewish traditions, claimed that God's desire wasn't punishment or exile, because God's will was that not even one would be destroyed. Not even one. So this logic caused some scribe to add a note in 1811 that some of your Bibles won't have in it. But a scribe later said, I, I get the story so much, like always, we bring with us, even the scribes who wrote scripture brought with them the stories being told. And he had to the line, the son of man came to rescue that which was lost. In one quick addition to the text, the implicit becomes the explicit, and God's holy system of exile, purification, and the Messiah's call to violent delights have been rewritten to celebrate bringing back into community those the former stories would have happily sacrificed to keep the people pure enough for reward. If you can't remember these stories of purification, if they don't just pop to mind, just listen to Ezra and Nehemiah which is a story of people returning, the story of the end of an exile. Pause in the sections dealing with people of the land, with the outsiders, and you will see that there was a story of purification, of purging, that could drive how we treat the marginalized. So therefore, Jesus offers us a choice from within the Jewish tradition, a choice of endings which will shape how we hold space today. Which story's logic will you hold on to? Jesus' reauthoring led a scribe to say the Son of Man, our long-awaited warrior king, came to rescue, which looks like bringing in rather than purging. So if we desire to hold on to the logic of divine punishment, then we'll be forced to wrestle with what this story says about God. If Jesus is right, and it is not the will of our Father in heaven that even one of these little ones would be destroyed, then we have to ask, does God's desire, does God's will win the day? If we say, yes, God's will wins the day, then we celebrate each return, not because they avoid a future punishment of hell, but because they join the inevitable future of a radically inclusive living community that hears the voices of the margins to trouble and decenter the expected, the common, the self-justifying story of power. Or... We can hold on to the other logic and we stoke the fires of hell and confidently state hell is real and God is too impotent to get what God desires. That is, if we believe Jesus, that God desires every one of the powerless, the marginalized, the little ones to have space, security, and presence, we would have to say that God doesn't get what God wants. If we believe that the will of God is that not one would be destroyed, if we believe that this is the way the story ends, then we must say Fate cannot, fate does not overrule God. So in the end of all things, when each being stands before God, the flames of retribution which warmed us will slowly die as we stop feeding it new bodies to burn. And this leaves us with a decision to make. Do we trust Jesus who said God doesn't desire even one to be destroyed? Or do we continue to warm ourselves with the stories of sinners in the hands of an angry God? feeding the flames of hells with those that we would count as lost. And let's be clear, those we would count would be different than those Matthew's gospel would count, would be different than those Luke's gospel would count, would be different than each incarnation of the Christian tradition going throughout time. The circle, the, the boundaries, the usness slides and moves and even changes within the traditions. Because we would set our boundary markers probably a little different than the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox. Even now, we see within our country, if you're listening to the wider Christian conversation, that the boundaries are shifting within denominations that they're saying, no, no, the lost are not who you think the lost are. And so that we're having schisms and splits and infighting. New bodies to burn. This leaves us with a decision to make. Do we trust Jesus who said, God doesn't even desire one to be destroyed? How we answer this also affects what animates the energy we put into evangelism, community building, and neighborly love. If it is no longer stoked by fear of an angry God, then it must be driven by the beauty of each person. It must be driven by the beauty of each future member coming into the sacred community. 
The words of Christ saying God will not destroy even one becomes an invitation to move closer to each other around Christ's table, not an escape from impending fire. For some, this view of a divine compassion smothering flames of punishment will scare the hell out of you. For me, I'm becoming so convinced of divine compassion, embodied in the love which drove a Messiah to drop the sword in order to pick up the child, to leave the center in order to center the marginalized, that I can no longer feel the flames of hell, since they could have nothing to do with a God who does not desire even one of these little ones to be destroyed. Because they cannot be destroyed, if that is not the desire, then we cannot have them in a never-ending torment. Now, or in the life to come. What ending are you living into? Does it end with overwhelming compassion or a rigid, unyielding, punishing form of justice? And this is what we want to sit in as we deconstruct and break apart settler Christianity and move towards a God whose compassion was so strong that in the face of Rome, set down a sword and pick up a child and say, the way of radical inclusion for the expanding community will be the way of God with us.